Today on Uncommon Knowledge, the man who knows more about presidential politics in the 21st century and the late 19th century than anyone else alive. Karl Rove, Uncommon Knowledge, now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge, I'm Peter Robinson. A native of Colorado, Carl Rove attended the University of Utah, the University of Maryland, George Mason University, and the University of Texas at Austin. As president of Carl Rove and Company, he directed the campaigns of some 75 Republican candidates for the House, for the Senate, and for a number of governorships. In 2000, he became the principal architect of the winning presidential campaign of George W. Bush, and then in 2004, he became the principal architect of George W. Bush's re-election campaign. Mr. Rove also served in the Bush administration throughout nearly all eight years. Now a columnist for the Wall Street Journal and a commentator for Fox News, Carl Rove is also an author. His latest, The Triumph of William McKinley, Why the Election of 1896 Still Matters. Carl, welcome. Thanks for having me. Let's start with the candidate himself. William McKinley, born in 1843, fought for the Union in the Civil War, became a leading lawyer in Canton, Ohio, represented Ohio for three terms in the House of Representatives, served from 1892 to 1896 as governor of Ohio, and then in 1896 is elected the 25th president of the United States and is assassinated at the age of 58 in 1901. Now, if most Americans share my education, You've got a sense of the founders, Washington, Adams, Jefferson. The next peak is Lincoln. And then there's a big empty space until you get to Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. And your man lies in that empty space and you say he's important. Yeah, look, uh, the election of 1896 has been studied by political scientists for decades as one of the five great realigning elections in American history. There are five points at which American politics is one way before a presidential election, and then after that point is something distinctly different. The election of 1800 with Thomas Jefferson ending the Federalist era. 1828 with the election of Andrew Jackson and the birth of the modern political party. 1860 in the election of uh, Abraham Lincoln and the, and the arrival of the Republicans. 1932 in FDR and the New Deal. And 1896, where we spend more time talking about the guy who lost the election, William Jennings Bryan, and the guy who follows McKinley, Theodore Roosevelt, who plays a minor yet a somewhat important role in the 1896 campaign. And more importantly, the 1896 campaign makes the future of Theodore Roosevelt possible, but only by Roosevelt being a complete weasel, a self-important, self ambitious uh, weasel who who, who takes advantage of the 1896 campaign to position himself for the job that gives him his future, namely the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. So let's try to place McKinley himself. Uh, a couple of spectrums. On one end of the spectrum, you've got Abraham Lincoln, born in a log cabin in what was then a very remote part of America, frontier man. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got both of the Roosevelts, born to wealthy families, born in the most cosmopolitan city, New York, exquisitely educated at private schools in Harvard. Where in this spectrum does William McKinley fall? McKinley lies closer to uh, Lincoln than he does to Roosevelt uh, by, by uh, background. He is born uh, the son of an of a, uh, iron smelter uh, in, uh, in northeast Ohio, which is part of a rapidly growing and rapidly industrializing part of the Midwest. He grows up, he's born in, in what is small town Ohio and grows to see it become in the aftermath of the Civil War a great commercial and manufacturing center. Uh, but we don't, you know, the amazing thing about it is we know a lot about uh, most of our presidents and we recognize the name McKinley. We have no understanding, most people do not have any understanding whatsoever what a remarkable human being is. He's, he is, like Lincoln, largely self-educated. He mm -hmm. goes to a little school called the Poland Academy in Poland, Ohio, sent there. His parents moved from Niles, where he's born, to Poland because there's a better school there. Uh, he uh, spends one semester at Allegheny College in Meadville, uh, Pennsylvania, but is uh, ill and has to return home. And after, uh, after the war, he becomes a lawyer by, by literally the old-fashioned way that, that he goes to Albany Law School for less than a year outside of Albany, New York. But like Lincoln, he studies for the law by being taken in by a patron, uh, a, a local judge in Youngstown, Ohio, named Glidden, 
who allows him to, to read for the law in his office. But one of the amazing things to me about it is, is we know nothing about his background as a war hero. Mm -hmm. You know, we honor JFK for PT-109. We, you know, we honor 41 for being the youngest uh, torpedo bomber pilot in the Navy in World War II. William McKinley enters the Civil War in April of 1861. He shows up with the Poland militia at, at Camp Jackson outside of Columbus, Ohio <clears throat> for 90-day enlistment. Lincoln has called for 90-day volunteers. When the men, the young men, all in their 18s and 19s, show up in Poland, uh, at, from Poland, Ohio, show up at Camp Jackson, they're told the 90-day quota has been fulfilled. You have two options, go home or enlist for three years or the duration, whichever is longer. And almost to a man, they enlist for three years or longer. He enters the war as a private. He ends the war at the age of 18. He ends the war at 22 as a major, having received three battlefield commissions for valor. He is recommended for the Congressional Medal of Honor, but refuses to be considered saying, I was only doing my duty. He undertakes two suicide missions. One suicide mission he develops for himself at the Battle of Antietam. The other, which is one of the most magnificent moments you could imagine, is 1864, the Battle of Kernstown in the Shenandoah Valley. Here this, this uh, 19 year old has developed into an astonishingly able young staff officer. And he is ordered by his brigade commander on the morning, of, on a September morning in, uh, in 1864, Jubal Early's Confederates break out of the forest and begin to collapse the Union left. And his brigade commander in charge of five regiments realizes that the regiment to the extreme right of the line, the 13th West Virginia, has not received the order to make an orderly withdrawal before, they, before they're chopped up. So he looks around, sees McKinley, his most able staff officer, and orders McKinley to ride to the 13th West Virginia, which means ride in front of the Union line, diagonally across the battlefield, getting ever closer to the Confederates, to get to the 13th West Virginia, which is in an orchard, and sheltered from the battle that's emerging around them and about ready to be cut off right. and shot to pieces. And um, McKinley's tent mate, Russell Hastings, later himself a general, said, we thought it was a suicide mission. And McKinley gets on his horse and begins to ride in front of the Union line and all hell is broken loose. Cannon shells are going off, musket fire everywhere. He's going through you know, a cloud of smoke on the, on the, uh, on the, on the battlefront. And, and, and his men are watching him make this ride and, and thinking they're, that he's gonna die. And at one point, a cannon shell goes off right near him and Hastings says we thought he was dead. And he said, he later wrote, out of the a cloud of gray smoke came the small brown horse with the erect horseman. McKinley makes it to the 13th West Virginia just in the nick of time. The, the startled commander of the, of the 13th West Virginia says, can we at least give them a round? Or, forms up the 13th West Virginia. They walk out of this orchard that they're in. The rebels are approaching them. They stop. They take one you know, blast at the rebels, decimating their front ranks, and, and then orderly retreat. McKinley rides around the back of the Union forces and, and arrives back at the, the commander's tent, his brigade commander's tent. He walks in. His brigade commander turns around and is aghast. Colonel Rutherford B. Hayes says to him, my God, I never expected to see you in, your, in this life again. The 23rd Ohio, out of hundreds of Northern regiments, had two future presidents and one future Supreme Court justice in its ranks. So by the time he's 20, this man whom very few Americans, including I have only the vaguest notion of William McKinley, Although all over the Midwest, every county courthouse has a statue to William McKinley because of the assassination. There was he a, was so popular. Affection. Everywhere I go, I was in Los Angeles at the Nixon Library, and a guy comes up to me and he says, I wondered why I went to, Nick, uh, to McKinley Elementary yes. In, yes. in Southern yes. California. Yeah. There was a generation long ago that really revered him, and yeah. you're telling us why. Carl, one other spectrum on the uh, spectrum of presidents. So on, on one hand, you've got Richard Nixon constantly calculating ill at ease, a formidable man in all kinds of ways, no mm -hmm. doubt, but ill at ease. And then on the other hand, you've got, let's say, FDR and Ronald Reagan, ebullient, put you at ease immediately. Where is William McKinley as a, as a human figure? What would it have been like to be in his presence? Well, uh, first of all, he would have been closer to, 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 to Reagan. Uh, he was a, a, a he was a, but he was a little bit more introverted, a lot more restrained and modest. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was beloved. He was a man who made friends easily and kept them for a long time. And he was, uh, he listened. And when he spoke, uh, he was well prepared and knowledgeable on the subject. And even his adversaries came to respect him enormously. Uh, his friends uh, and his compatriots in the Republican Party uh, were, uh, you know, he was a protege of the, of the Republican leader on the Ways and Means Committee, 
Pig Iron Kelly of Pennsylvania. And Pig Iron was blown away with the first speech that McKinley gave on the floor and gave him increasing responsibilities as a young member. But Thomas Brackett Reed, the absurdic Republican Speaker of the House, uh, once complained, he said, you know, my adversaries in the House uh, go at me tooth and nail, but they always feel obliged to apologize to William before they call him names. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this was an era of intense partisanship. Yes. And one of the weird things about it that I found out is if you were, if your party lost control of the House of Representatives and you had won a narrow re-election, they kicked you out. McKinley is first elected in 1876. He is re-elected in 1880 comfortably in a swing district. And in 1882, again in, a, in his swing district, wins re-election by seven votes. And the Democrats take, can retake control of the House. And what happens is, is that they kick him out. They refuse to seat him? Well, they, hold, they, they, they seat him provisionally, but then the elections committee here is a challenge to him. And after a reasonable period of time, they kick him out. And when they kick him out, something unusual happens. This is routinely done. When the Republicans took control, they looked for every Democrat, particularly in the South, that they could kick out on an election challenge. When the Democrats took control, they looked for every Republican, particularly in the South and the Midwest, that they could kick out, that they came anything close to. And so they kick him out. And when he, they do, seven Democrats break party ranks, and among them are his leading opponents on the issue of protection. In a very short time, he's a junior member, and he's in his third term. He has become the, one of the leading, if not the leading spokesman for Republicans on economic policy. And his greatest adversaries, free trade Democrats from the South in particular, stand up and as a mark of respect, they know that he's, he's, he's going to be tossed out, but they want to show their respect for him and they vote for, to retain him in the House. And, and that happened very early on. And, it, and that uh, uh, friendship and appreciation and respect for him only grew over time. So you just mentioned one of the big issues. We've got a couple issues. By the way, Walter Russell Mead, in reviewing you this, this, book, this book, praises you for taking on the Herculean task of explaining the meaning of tariff and monetary controversies to 21st century readers. All right, Hercules. <laughs> I need you to take on the task oh God, right no, here again. in front of us. So uh, obviously, this is, this is film. So as briefly as you can to make us understand what we need to understand, the monetary issue. In 1896, what difference does it make whether we had hard money or soft money? What was hard money? What was yeah. soft money? Well, hard money was money backed by gold. Right. Uh, soft money was money backed by silver. The difference being that the way that you define the weight of a silver dollar, it had 52 cents worth of silver in it. A gold dollar, the way you define it in law, had a dollar's worth of gold. So what would happen is, is that if you coined, had unlimited coinage of silver, if you had silver from anywhere in the United States or anywhere in the world, all you had to do was show up at the mint, they were obligated to buy it, to pay you a dollar for 52 cents worth of silver, which immediately was, would inflate the, the currency. Right. And then they would coin that into silver dollars and add them into, con, into circulation, which again would inflate the, the economy. So, so it's a fight about the money supply. That's right, but there's a deeper battle in it. And it's sort of hard for us to understand, you know, gold versus silver today. But in his Cross of Gold speech, William Jennings Bryan defines this in a way that might seem reasonably familiar to Americans. At the heart of the battle over currency, he said in his famous Cross of Gold speech, is this. There are two ideas of government. The Republicans believe if you just legislate to make the well-to-do prosperous, then their prosperity will leak through on those below. Democrats believe if you legislate to make the masses prosperous, their prosperity will find its way up and through every class that rests upon it. This was the issue of the 1896 campaign. Were you going to favor economic policies that made the wealthy prosperous and trickled down to those below down. it? They were or were you favoring those to make the people at the bottom of the pyramid wealthy so their prosperity would move up? Would you, would you favor the, a system that, award, that rewarded the wealthy or would you rebalance the system by being concerned about the inequality of wealth between those at the top and those at the bottom? Okay, we'll come to McKinley in a moment, but first the second issue, the second great issue of the day, tariffs. That is levying taxes, well, a tariff means on an export or an import, but we're talking substantially about levying taxes on imports. Well, there's one fact that both, uh, both parties agreed upon. Tariffs were the principal source of revenue for the government. This both is long before the federal long income Long before. Tax. You know, look, this goes back to you know, 18, uh, 1812 and Henry Clay and the American system as Speaker of the House. He favors it. Jefferson is an advocate of protective tariffs. Hamilton and Washington are advocates of protective tariffs. Lincoln was a firm advocate. But the both parties agreed tariffs were the principal source of revenue for the government. 
Democrats looked at that and said, we want tariffs as low as possible in order to keep the federal government small. They were the small government party of the time. In addition, they were anti-tariff because they said, tariffs are not paid by the foreign, foreigners who send their goods here, but by the Americans who buy them. So it is a tax upon the working people at the bottom of the, of, of the, of the pyramid. We're, we're causing farmers and working class people to pay more for crockery and farm implements right. than they would otherwise in order to fund the federal government. Republicans looked at it and said, this is a way to protect the nascent growing industries in America. Cheap foreign labor will, will flood our country with goods, and, with goods that are made by cheap foreigners and that will keep us from developing our domestic industries. And then of course, there were a great many people in the Republican Party, particularly industrialists, who favored the tariff system because they could game it. By keeping out foreign goods, they, they, could, they could have higher profit margins. McKinley was a moderate, he, his, his, his reputation is as a high tariff man, but he really was a moderate tariff man. He really believed his concern was about the working man. So he wanted to protect their jobs. And when, as chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, people would come before him and argue for higher tariffs, his argument to them was, don't tell me how much you need to make. Tell me what we need to do to protect the working man. Got it. So, Carl, your subtitle here is why the election of 1896 still matters. So let me just, while we're on trade, just a little parenthesis here. Since 1980 at least, since the election of Ronald Reagan at least, the Republican Party, the current Republican Party has been free trade. The freer the trade, the better. And along comes Donald Trump and says, no, you're hurting the working man. We need to raise tariffs. It's 1896 all over again. Is Donald Trump reaching back to an honorable Republican tradition? Well, he's reaching back to what the Republican Party used to stand for, but let's be very careful about yes, this. Yes, we have to be careful. That's, Cause, why, cause, that's why I'm cause, asking cause, you. Because look, that, that's not the lesson. The lesson of 1896 has to be understood in this way. The politics of the American political system is broken before 1896. We have five presidential elections in a row in which nobody gets 50% of the vote. We have two of those presidential elections in which somebody wins a majority in the electoral college, but actually loses the popular vote. We have a third election in which somebody wins the, popular, wins the Electoral College and a plurality of the popular vote, but by 7,000 votes over his Democrat opponent nationwide. We have complete divided government. 20 out of 24 years is divided government. Two years a Republican president, Republican House, Republican Senate. Two years a Democratic president, Democratic House, Democratic Senate. And they hate each other. The animosity in Congress is not merely partisan. It's colored deeply by the Civil War. In fact, when the Democrats win control of the House for the first time since 1858, in 1874, it's called the victory of the brigadiers because of all the Confederate generals and officers who get elected to take back the, the House of Representatives. So it's a broken political system, and both parties are right up against each other like this, sort of like how we've been over most of the last several decades of constant turnovers in government and divided government. And along comes McKinley, modernizes the Republican Party, dramatically changes its coalition, and then governs as he said he would, and creates a dominant Republican majority for most of the next 36 years. For most of the next 36 years, Republicans control the Senate for 30, the White House for 28, the House for 26. We would have controlled it more, more years if we hadn't split in 1912 for four years. We control more governors and state legislatures than we do for the next 90 years. And most of the mayors and most of the towns above the Mason-Dixon line, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Chicago, St. Louis, San Francisco, Los Angeles, most of the mayors during these periods of time are Republicans. And it's because McKinley is a, is a political leader who sees that his party is at risk of being demographically overrun. The, the black Republican vote in the South is being wiped out, so the Republicans have no chance of electoral votes in the South and few opportunities for votes in the House and the Senate. In the entire South, in 1896, there's one U.S. Senator who's a Republican from the South, Jeter Pritchett of North Carolina, and a handful of Republicans from upcountry districts. And despite the fact that we have four states that are black majority, and there are no elected Republicans right. from those states. Right. And on the other hand, he says, my party is being wiped out in the North because it is the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant party. The largest interest group in the country is a virulently anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant group called the American Protective Association. So what I take from 1896 is not any particular issue. The Republicans were for bigger government and higher tariffs, Democrats for smaller government and, 
and, and lower tariffs or free trade. Democrats were also in favor of repression of black voting rights in the South, and the Republicans were in favor of support for them. So the parties had different agendas back then. What I take away is the activity of a visionary leader who conducts a campaign that is about bringing us together. That, you know, William Jennings Bryan is saying, if you're against me, you are a tool of the, of the magnets uh, uh, on Wall Street. You are a, you know, are, you are a pawn can, can, of the money power. And McKinley says, we're all in this together. Okay, T- uh, terrific, and I've got about half a dozen questions I want to ask about that. But let's pull, Brian. Brian deserves a, a, a mention yes. or two of his own. Yeah. And again, I'm, I'm reading your book here. Let me hold this up because it, it is a beautiful read and everybody ought to memorize this cover and go <laughs> buy the thing. Available on Amazon. Available on Amazon, I'm sure. <laughs> or at your independent bookshop. <laughs> Barnes & Noble. Uh, so the other fascinating parallel here that I'd like to, how, to the extent that it is a parallel, how far can we push this, is William Jennings Bryan who seems to come out of nowhere, captures his party's nomination on the strength of one thrilling speech, and becomes, as far as I can tell, what we would recognize as the first modern populist. Now, here's what I want to say. Am I talking sense here? You've got William Jennings Bryan, populist in 1896. He runs for president two more times, defeated all three times, but there's a movement. There's something going on there. You see it again in uh, Henry Wallace, who uh, one of Franklin Roosevelt's vice presidents, he runs for president himself on the Progressive Party ticket in 1948, gets wiped out, but he represents something. Yeah. And then maybe even George McGovern, but of course the question I have is, is there something that we can see in Williams Jennings Bryan that we also recognize in Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, yeah. or is that ridiculous? Well, what do you think? Yes, I, I, no, totally, totally. Uh, first of all, you're absolutely right. He wins the Democratic nomination on the basis of a speech a speech which itself is the result of seven accidents occurring in the days leading into it. Any one of which, if any one of these seven moments, some of which are trivial in nature, had gone a different direction, he would not have been able to give that speech and galvanize the convention. For example, one of the moments is, is that, uh, the, is that uh, on the first day of the convention, uh, he's considered to be temporary chairman. But, but people say, you know, he's not a delegate yet. Nebraska's delegation is under, is under a protest. We've seated provisionally the gold delegates from Nebraska. He's a silver man. He can't be considered for temporary chairman because he's not a delegate yet. And yet, if he had been, he might have been elected temporary chairman and unable to give that speech. Huh. The final accident occurs 15 minutes before he gives a speech. And with that, without that accident taking place, he would not have given that speech and might not have uttered those, uh, those famous lines of, uh, about the cross of gold. But, but yes, look, he represents two strains that we see in this election, in my opinion. In the current election. In the current election. He is, first of all, an economic populist. He is Bernie Sanders only at the age of 36. 74-year-old Bernie Sanders and 36-year-old William Jennings Bryan sound the same. The man at the top is getting rich. You're getting poor. You know, the system is rigged against you. In, in Brian's case, it was the money power of Lombard Street, the British, uh, the British Wall Street, and the, and the idle capital holders of Wall Street. Remember, we're a developing country in 1896. Right. So we, our economy goes, on, think about uh, Brazil, India today. We go only in 1896 because we got foreigners investing in our country. Right. But he is angry at that. He also represented cultural populism, which is not uh, Bernie Sanders, it's Donald Trump. The America you see in front of us is changing dramatically. All the old familiar touchstones are changing because we're becoming a rapidly industrializing country, no longer agrarian in nature, and we are a a, a rapidly diversifying uh, uh, population. Before 1896, actually before the Civil War and shortly thereafter, we were a country of immigrants, but they came from familiar places. Germany, United Kingdom, England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, Northern Europe. Afterwards, they now start coming from Central Europe and Southern Europe, and he is representing a strain that says, you know what, that, that threatens us. He, he, in his Cross of Gold speech, remember, he, he says, if your great cities are burned to the ground and you leave our farms alone, the cities will spring up again. But if, you're, if, the, if, if our farms are raised, those cities, the grass will grow in their streets. And when he leaves Lincoln, Nebraska to go accept the Democratic nomination in, in, uh, in New York City in early August, he says at the, at the train depot in Lincoln, I go into the enemy's country, meaning that you know, the rural agrarian rest, west and south versus the urban and industrializing Midwest and, and east. Got it. 
you close the book, The Triumph of Willie McKinley, with a number of lessons. Now, we don't have time, again, it's, this is video, but a couple of these lessons. The Triumph of Willie McKinley, I'm quoting you. McKinley conducted a campaign based on big issues. While McKinley initially resisted tackling sound money and wanted to campaign exclusively on protection, he came to understand that many Americans wanted to hear where he stood on both. So my first reaction to that is, you know, in a, in a certain sense, this is touching. It's reassuring. What Carl is saying is that in 1896, democracy worked. Mm -hmm. he, he stood for big issues and the country responded. Yeah. Today's big issues? Well, I think one of the big issues is economic insecurity. I don't think it's economic inequality. I don't think people begrudge uh, Bill Gates his fortune for having founded that company. What I do think people are, are increasingly insecure about their place in the economy. Do I have the skills to compete? Well, my kids have the skills to compete. Is the system rigged against me? Uh, is, 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 why is it that I don't seem to be getting ahead when I'm working so hard? What about my family security? Am I going to be able to provide for them? Are, are the social safety nets going to be there? And, and the idea of somebody stepping forward and saying, we, we must all focus our energies and efforts to put in place the policies that will allow people who work hard to get ahead and for our economy to grow at a faster rate so that prosperity spreads to every corner in every community of America where we have people willing to dream big, take the personal responsibility, and work hard is, is, I think, an important and compelling message, as it was in 1896. And that was essentially McKinley's message. Yeah. The issues have changed. We're in, that it, was we're, essentially... we're in it together, he says. Yeah. And, and yeah. he says, let, let us not pit capital and labor against each other. Neither capital nor labor can be prosperous without the other being prosperous. The triumph of William McKinley once again. McKinley won because he broadened the electoral battlefield. He broadened the electoral battlefield. Now you, consummate professional that you are, you actually mean the battlefield. Right. He, he fought in more states than it would right. have been expected for a Republican right. to do. Is that right. correct? Yeah, absolutely. The battleground states in the Gilded Era are five. Indiana, Ohio, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. And McKinley fights in those states, but he also fights in, most importantly, the border and upper south. Now he does not win in Tennessee and North Carolina and Virginia. But he carries, and he does not win in Missouri because the Republicans split among themselves. There's a battle between two very interesting characters, one who is loyal to McKinley and the other one who claims to be loyal to McKinley but is really out for himself. The old man is his nickname. But McKinley wins Kentucky, which had not been won by the Republicans since the Civil War. West Virginia, which again had not been won since 1864. Maryland, which had never gone Republican, and Delaware. And he then also holds the states in the Midwest, which, were, which he was losing in July and August. In July and August, he's losing Iowa. McMillan, the, the Iowa chairman, Republican chairman, is conducting a canvas. Back then, they didn't take polls. Instead, they had their precinct chairman go to everybody in their precinct, divine who they were for, and report on every single voter in their precinct to the county chairman who bundled those together and reported them to the state chairman. So McMillan says, we're losing 25% of our Republican farmers. We're going to get beaten and beaten badly. But McKinley then wins these battleground states in North Dakota and in uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin and Illinois and Iowa, and, and thereby you know, uh, keeps uh, Brian from his majority. Uh, and again, he does it by taking on these big... Big, big issues. Okay. Carl, a few final questions. Listen, you write a column for the Wall Street Journal. That's a deadline a week. You're a commentator for Fox News. That means they pay you to get you on the air when they want you. Mm -hmm. And this coming year, they're going to want you a lot. How, do you, how does your life work? How do you find time to research and write a really fine well, work of history. And that's not just me talking. Well, all the reviewers said, whatever you think of Rove, yeah. this is a good work yeah. of history. Well, look, I, first of all, How I do you have do eight, this? Well, I have 18 bins of archival material. And I had some really great research assistants to help me pull it all together. But I literally was, and I have a huge, I mean, I was touting, I, I read nothing for three years except Gilded Age memoirs and Gilded Age books. But I, I was really, I was so fascinated with the story that I was riding on airplanes and you know hotel rooms and you know beach on, sitting on the beach and I mean it was fat, it was just fun to write because there's so many interesting characters and there's such an interesting drama and it turned out not to be dry anonymous forces of culture and politics working their way through the American political system it's human beings making mistakes making great judgments uh, you know and you, find, you found these guys good company oh they were you wonderful you enjoyed company. William McKinley you enjoyed Mark Hanna his yeah. campaign manager well I mean, he's not his campaign manager 
Think of him as Don Evans to George W. Bush, the, the great friend of the candidate, the campaign manager for the general election. To the degree that there's a strategic brain, it's McKinley himself, but the campaign manager is a 31-year-old kid. McKin really? McKinley meets him when he is a young lawyer in Lincoln, Nebraska in 1894. The kid actually comes to Columbus and says, you knew my dad. If you run for president, I'm for you. And then he meets him again in October of 1894 when he goes to Lincoln campaigning in the midterm elections. And the kid has said, I'm working on Wyoming and North Dakota, and I got some guys lined up for you here in, in, in Nebraska. Then the kid decides to move to Chicago at the age of 29 in January of 1895. This is going to be the most important state in the Republican presidential battle, and everybody knows it right from the beginning. New York and Pennsylvania are the two biggest delegations controlled by the combine, the Republican machine bosses. Then Ohio, which McKinley is desperately trying to keep together, and the next biggest delegation is going to be Illinois, and everybody knows that may decide the contest. So what does McKinley do? He takes the 29-year-old kid who's moved to Chicago and says, you're in command of my campaign. And the kid is such an incredible leader. He has three people helping him. What's his him. name? Charles G. Dawes. Oh, of course. Okay. And McKinley, McKinley says to, to him, you're in charge. He has two older Republicans who are lifelong Illinois Republican activists who are twice his age, both of them Civil War generals. They start calling him the general in a loving way because he is so meticulous, so well organized, tall, thin, redhead, parts his hair in the middle, smokes a corncob pipe occasionally that he can never get right. So he's always, it's always turned sideways and hot ashes, uh, hot tobacco is falling on him. His, it, when he swears, he yells, hell, fire, and Maria. And, and, the, and these two generals become so, um, so committed to him that, that they, they start calling him the general. And he wins. When he wins the Illinois Republican Convention against the Chicago machine, mm -hmm. this, this, uh, one of McKinley's advisors says, this is the Gettysburg of the contest. And when he wins it, McKinley sits down that night and writes him a letter, which is how I really stumbled across him, because it, it just, it says so, the letter says so much about him, about how McKinley thought about him. He writes him this letter saying, in his beautiful handwriting, I cannot close the day without sending you a message of appreciation and congratulations. There is nothing in all of this long campaign so signal and significant as the triumph at Springfield. I cannot find words to express my admiration for your high qualities of leadership. You have one exceptional honor. You had long ago won my heart. So first Lee Atwater and then Carl Rove are working in the tradition of bright young men established by Charles G. Dawes. Who later goes on to win the Nobel Peace Prize, be the first director of the Bureau of the Budget, comptroller of the currents at the age of 32, vice president of the United States, and first, first head of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and ambassador to Great Britain. Okay. He's 29 when McKinley Okay, passed. Rove, I'm not talking to you again until you win the Nobel Peace Prize. No, it's not happening. Not so happening. listen, one other question about that campaign. Brian barnstorms, well, not barnstorming, that wasn't the term in those days, but he, he travels all around the country. He speaks over 100 times in 100 different places. O over 600 times that I can find. 600 times that you there can find. There are texts find. of 600 speeches. Astonishing. 18,000 miles on a train, and until October 7th, he's mostly getting up in the morning, buying his own train ticket, grabbing a meal at, at, when the, at a depot stop, hoping to God that somebody has a room for him that night when he arrives wherever he's arriving. It's not until October 7th that the Democrats scrape together enough money to put him in his own private rail car. And by contrast, your man, William McKinley, is staying right at home, literally in his own home in Canton, Ohio, and giving speeches each day, or nearly every day, from his front porch right. to different groups that the Republican Party arranges to bring in. And these speeches are carefully written, thoughtful, tailored to each group. So it's not as if, it's not like a stump speech that a candidate would give today where, well, you know, I'm an old speechwriter. You give essentially the same speech because that's all the candidate can keep in his mind. Three, and then you change the, th the people you thank. No, 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 no. These are quite different speeches. So here's the question. That campaign was conducted largely through the medium of print. Mm -hmm. McKinley speeches are carefully written to be heard surely by his audience, but to be read right. in newspapers across the country, to be reprinted and mailed. One of the things I found so striking is that there are literally millions of pieces of mail that are mailed to Republican Targets. prospects for the yeah. Repu Republican voters. Is that gone? Can you have that kind of intellectual ca caliber Right through McKinley, at least, really right through the 30s, you could still say that speeches were written to be read, that the American voter remained literate. Is that gone? You know, I, I, no. 
I don't think so. I think I think you'd have to to, to adopt the fact that that today you can't stay in one place, but you could do what McKinley did, which is. You could, you know, McKinley took a great interest in his speeches and a great interest in, you could have a candidate who moves around the country who has a common theme, but in front of different audiences supports that common theme with different, with different ways of expression. Uh, but, but look, uh, it is a different time. But I think the fact that he had a unifying positive message consistently through those speeches, and, he, and he, one of the reasons he stays in, in uh, Canton, Ohio, is he says, I need to think before I talk. And he didn't want to go on the road. He'd been on the road in 1894. He'd been on the road in 1890 in the midterm elections. He'd barnstormed the country before. He knew it. And, and he knew what the drain was on him. And he would rather, I mean, he, this is not like it was a light load. I mean, some days he speaks to, he gives 16 speeches in a day. And some of the weekends, there are 150,000 people who parade through Canton, Ohio. And, and you're right, each one of them is methodically prepared. But he, to, and today, he could, think about this, if he were giving not 16, but let's say five or six speeches in a day, he could dominate several news periods during that day by saying something slightly different, which is what right. he did. Right. Now, right. the audiences are diverse. This is where what, what was smart. They, did, they invited lots of different kinds of people. I mean, not typical Republicans. They had bohemian beer, uh, beer meisters. Confederate veterans. Well, this is one of the ma magnificent moments, October 9th, 1896. No Republican presidential candidate has ever met with an organized group of Confederate veterans. No Republican president has met with or, or, uh, Confederate veterans. And McKinley invites, through the auspices of, of Reverend Funkhauser of Harrisonburg, Virginia, invites 2,000 Confederate veterans to come to Kent. And they start arriving 40 train carloads of the veterans and their, their spouses. They get off of the train. They're met by the wives of the general of the Grand Army of the Republic, the Northern Veterans Group, and an honor guard from uh, a, a band, an honor guard, and an uh, manned escort, honor escort. They're presented a beautiful silk banner to commemorate their day. They're each given a pocket knife with a favorite phrase of McKinley's drawn from uh, Washington's farewell address, no east, no west, no north, nor south, but a common country. They're taken to the, to the, uh, to the tabernacle, fed lunch. Some of their compatriots are arriving late because their train was delayed. They wait until they arrive. Then they form up, Union veterans and Confederate veterans alike in the courthouse square, and led by flags and banners and, and uh, bands, they march up, they march out of the square and march up North Market Street towards McKinley's home. The streets are lined with thousands upon thousands of people singing patriotic songs, many of them openly weeping at this vision of blue and gray together. They arrive in front of McKinley's uh, house. McKinley emerges. And I can tell from reading his speeches what it, you know, you can tell the ones that are formulaic. You can sure. tell also the ones that are deeply personal. And this is deeply personal and short. He says, sectionalism was surrendered at Appomattox. Not the Confederacy, not this or that, but sectionalism, the idea that we were not one together. He says, if we're ever forced to fight again, and God forbid that we are, we will fight together as brothers under a common flag. And I mean, people are weeping openly at this site. 2,000 veterans stand up, march across, walk across his front porch, shake the major's hand, they're fed dinner, they then conduct until midnight a concert by the, by the Confederate bands in the courthouse square before they are escorted to the train at midnight to return to Virginia. And this has never happened in American politics before. And you can just imagine the coverage around the country and how this, this galvanized the country. Because here's a man saying we're all in this together at the same time that the populist is saying it's us versus them, it's us versus the, the, the bad guys. You know, we're the, we're the good guys. There's nothing but evil on the other side. Carl, once again, last couple of questions for you here. The triumph of William McKinley, quote, the bigger, stronger electoral coalition that McKinley built for his party endured for nearly four decades, making the period between 1896 and 1932 a time of GOP dominance. The Republican Party was no longer a shrinking and beleaguered political organization composed largely of white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Instead, it was a frothy, diverse coalition of owners and workers Longtime Americans and new citizens, lifetime Republicans and fresh converts, drawn together by common beliefs and allegiances. Now that is not just a succinct summary of McKinley's accomplishment. That is a summary of the Republican dream, at mm -hmm. least since 1980. Mm -hmm. How can we make it permanent? How can Republicans continue to reach out? And yet, here we are in 2016 and 
boy, is there a lot about the GOP that still seems to be in a defensive yeah. crouch. Why is this so hard? You made no secret that during eight years of George W. Bush's presidency, trying to reach out, trying to broaden, trying to recreate the McKinley accomplishment. Why is this so hard? Well, for us, it was hard because we faced the war. 9-11 that changed just, so, so many things. It made, made it hard. I mean, we had that kind of coalition in the 2004 election. Remember, we're grossly outspent in 2004. We're in the middle of an unpopular war, and yet Bush gets reelected by a comfortable margin and gets 44% of the Latinos, erases the gender gap. and gets 44% of Latinos? The Latinos in 2004. Erases the gender gap. There is no gender gap. We get the soccer moms to come across. And he gets the highest percentage of... Uh, of of, uh, of the Jewish vote since Ronald Reagan, 1984, and we essentially, uh, you know, uh, win re-election by re by reframing the Republican Party and growing it. But the war was unpopular, and uh, you know, I, the South Carolina primary. And, and this is Marco Rubio, Cuban American, young, standing next to Nikki Haley, the daughter of immigrants from India, standing next to Tim Scott, African American U.S. senator, son of a single mom single welfare mom. What a picture that was. And that's what the Republican Party needs to, to aim for. And that's what McKinley aimed for. When, by bringing all those diverse groups to Canton, Ohio, he was signaling that the Republican Party was open to everyone. When he becomes the first Republican presidential candidate to ever be endorsed by openly by a member of the Catholic hierarchy, it is like a bomb going off. When the Bishop of St. Paul, Minnesota, Bishop Ireland, endorses him in an open public letter in early October, it is like jaw-dropping because what this says to Catholics who are increasingly Democrat and are feeling estranged from the Republican Party, that it says this guy accepts us and he's open to us. And, and, but look, not only did he run this way, this is a book in about an election. He also governed that way. He carried the, 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 the working man's vote, the laborer vote, which was a swing vote in 1896. He carries it overwhelmingly. He carries the city of New York. He carries the factory districts of Boston, the, the stockyards of, of, of uh, Chicago. He, he wins the industrial America. And then when he becomes president, his economic policies help the country uh, to return to prosperity after the deepest depression that we have until the Great Depression. And as a result, he locks in working class people. Working class people say the Republican Party stands for me. And they say it for the next 30 some odd years. This may be something of a reach, but I can't help wondering, how would McKinley What's the right lesson to draw from his, from his approach, his constant embrace of more and more groups, his defense of the working man? What lesson can we draw for, from that for the McKinley, I beg your pardon, for the Scalia vacancy? Majority leader, Republican majority leader Mitch McConnell, the very day of Justice McKinley's death said, nothing doing. Yeah. We're not even going to consider a nominee by the current president. Right. This is shut down until after the next presidential election which may be right on, in all kinds of ways, but right. looks like a defensive crouch. Yeah. Well, it does. I don't think there's any comparable uh, item here. The Democrats were, incidentally, obstructionists there of their own uh, in, during the Gilded Age. I mean, in yep. 1891, they literally say the House of Representatives, now taken over control by Republicans, will not be allowed to consider a single bill. They'll refuse to answer the roll call so the House Republicans can't take, take up a single measure. So That was hardball. That was hardball. And, in fact, one of the Democrats... Uh, stands up William Henry Hattie Martin of Texas, six foot six inches tall, uh, thin as a rail, mean as a snake, fought the entire Civil War at the Hood's Brigade. He points his finger at, at, at Reed, who himself is pretty big. Reed's right. 6'3", 300 pounds, looks like a bowling pin with a walrus mustache. And Martin points his finger at him and says, if any member will order me to remove this dictator from his position of power upon the podium, I will do so by force. And, and Reed says, the honorable gentleman from, from Texas is out of order and moves on. The next day, Howdy Martin shows up, takes a position on the floor right in front of, 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 uh, of Reed during the opening of the three-month-long debate on whether or not he had the authority to do what he did and pulls out a 16-inch long Bowie knife and begins to methodically sharpen it on his boot sole to menace Reed. Now, I don't remember Nancy Pelosi doing that in 2011, but I may have missed the moment. But that's how, that's how ugly that's how, the politics was. That's how ugly so do you have advice on, on how Republicans yeah, look, we handle need, this yeah, Scalia three, vacancy? Three, yeah, look, I do think that they need to say, American, we're in this together. This decision is best left to the next president, Republican or Democrat alike. We will, we will hear 
the nomination. Uh, you know that that could be their choice. But we 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 do not think we think the country's unity demands that the next president. We're, we're too divided over this. Our country is too concerned about the executive overreach. It, this is a decision left for the for the best interest of our country. This is a decision left best to the next president, Republican or Democrat. We have not done this in a hundred years, in, in, in almost a hundred years. It was eighty years ago that we settled a nomination in the middle of of a presidential election. And it is better for our country. If we love our country, let us do the best thing for our country and leave this for the next president for him or her to decide. All right. Carl, last question. Claire Booth Luce used to say that history had time to give even the greatest men just a single sentence. Lincoln freed the slaves. Churchill saved Britain from Hitler. What's one sentence that history will give William McKinley? William McKinley uh, changed American politics for the better by modernizing his party and confronting the worst elements of politics to bring the country together. Carl Rove, author of The Triumph of William McKinley, Why the Election of 1896 Still Matters. Thanks so much. Thank you. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge and the Hoover Institution. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.